reading from God's Word found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Next Sunday is the Christmas cantata. Uh, remember, 9 o'clock. Uh, if you come at 10, we'll be getting ready to probably uh, exit. Because uh, next week is the Christmas cantata, that means uh, I need to give you two jokes today because <laughs> I won't have an opportunity next Sunday. Uh, what do you get when you cross an iPad with a Christmas tree? A pineapple. <laughs> now some of you may have to think about that for a while, but... Okay, and uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, Teresa Truesdale was in the 8 o'clock service, but this is on the kindergarten level, uh, but that's usually where all my jokes are anyway. So, uh, uh, knock, knock. Yeah. Olive. Olive. All of the other reindeer. That would make a good song, wouldn't it? I just really appreciate everything that's already happened. I feel uh, uh, especially blessed. Uh, I've enjoyed the music. We had a baptism. Uh, joyful, joyful, uh, we adore thee. It wasn't the Christmas words, but those were the words uh, of the congregational hymn when Melinda and I got married. And uh, Angels Making Their Round is my favorite uh, choir rendition uh, during the Christmas season. So it's pretty awesome. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, we bow before you and we just thank you for this time of year. We thank you for uh, the fact that we can remember, we can celebrate uh, the love that moved you to send your son Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you took on human flesh. You became one of us. Uh, you lived a perfect sinless life. And when you went to the cross, you didn't go as a victim. You willingly went to bear our sins, all our wrongdoing, upon yourself. So that by faith in you, God could be righteous and just in forgiving us. And when you rose victorious from the dead, you made life everlasting possible for us. And you opened the gates of heaven for all to come in through faith in you. Lord, I pray that you would bless these uh, few moments in which we look at your word. Uh, may you uh, strengthen, encourage, and challenge us. And may we be able to take something from this and uh, live it out and share it with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was... Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's commonly said that uh, Christianity is just a crutch for people. In fact, Sigmund Freud uh, uh, spoke about that kind of thing. Um, and, but the reality is it takes great strength uh, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It requires some uh, courage to, uh, to 
profess, as Emily did this morning, uh, your faith in the Lord and to uh, follow after Him. There are times in which you're going to feel like you're going upstream, that you're uh, moving against uh, the tide, the current around you. And we don't have to go any farther than the Christmas story and see uh, some of the individuals in the account of the coming of Christ to see some courage that's demonstrated. And Joseph is a perfect example of that from the passage in Matthew that Bob read for us. Uh, Joseph models for us the courage that's required to receive the gift of Emmanuel, God with us. We're just going to make three simple observations from this passage uh, of the courage that Joseph demonstrated. And it's same kind of courage that we kind of need in our own lives. And the first one is, you and I must have courage uh, to be willing to be ridiculed by the world. We, we kind of need to expect that. Uh, Gabriel, the angel, spoke to Joseph and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid uh, to take Mary as your wife. Uh, for the child within her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we, we heard in the passage, Joseph found out that uh, Mary was uh, pregnant. Uh, they were engaged, Jewish engagements uh, are about, they were about a year long. And, uh, and he finds out she's pregnant and he doesn't want to disgrace her. That culture was a shame culture. Uh, it, it was unlike our culture in that our culture emphasizes personal rights, personal decisions, all of that. It's more of a culture that, that uh, the collective right and wrong influences everybody else and everybody kind of needs to line up with it. And if you don't line up with it, then uh, you're, you're ostracized. You're, 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 you're treated as if you, you really don't belong or you're kind of a second-class citizen. And Joseph uh, knew uh, that there would be people who would never understand uh, what was going on with him and with Mary. And that required courage on his part when he's told, this child is by the Holy Spirit, and uh, it's fine for you to take Mary as your wife, because he knew his reputation would never be the same. Uh, he, his, his reputation would suffer. And uh, he would be kind of forever a second-class citizen. Think about it with me for a moment. Um, Joseph and Mary, we know the story from Luke that they, they had to go to Bethlehem because of uh, taxes. We all love taxes, don't we? Um, they somehow weave themselves even into the Christmas story. But, um, so they had to go back to uh, his, his family of origins town the city of David, Bethlehem. And you know from the plays and the kids acting it all out that uh, there's this little character that has, when they come up and they, they ask, could, could we have a night stay here? That innkeeper has to say, no room. There's no room at the inn. Now, to this day, if I had to go to Columbus, Ohio, I would not have to stay in a hotel. You know why? There's family there. And even though we were not originally from Ironton, Ohio, if we traveled to Ironton or Ashland, we wouldn't stay in a hotel or motel. You know why? Because we have church family there. Joseph, this was his family of origins town. There would have been people there that would have been related to Joseph. Maybe second, third cousins, an aunt, an uncle, someone like that. We're, there's no mention of them going to anybody's house. They go to an inn. Why? Because they wouldn't have been accepted in a family's house. Because everybody knew and they presumed that something wrong had happened. And so Joseph knew that, and that was going to be their life. Do you know to this very day, we're, we're blessed in this nation, but we have 
brothers and sisters in other countries that the moment they're baptized like Emily was this morning, their family cuts them off. They, they, they have no connection with their family because they profess faith in Christ. Others can lose their jobs. Um, there's, it takes courage to say, hey, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. And we shouldn't be surprised if people uh, uh, don't think highly sometimes of the fact that we express faith and trust in the Lord. Second thing is we can see from Joseph is uh, you must have courage to give up the right of self-determination. What does that mean, Pastor? Where, where are you coming from on that? Joseph told, uh, or Gabriel told Joseph, uh, she will have a son, and you will give his name Jesus. Jesus will be his name. Now, in that culture, it was the father's absolute right to give the name to the child. It demonstrated dad had authority over each of the children, and he named them. Uh, in, in, in the story, in the account in Luke, before we hear of Jesus' birth, we hear of John the Baptist's birth. And Zechariah, the, he's, he's in the temple. The angel appears to him and says, Hey, Zechariah, uh, your prayers are being answered. God is going to bless you and Elizabeth with a son. And Zechariah, he, he doesn't believe it. And uh, so the, the angel announced, it's going to happen, but uh, because you, you doubted, you, you don't believe, uh, you're not going to be able to speak. And nine-some months later, Elizabeth gives birth to uh, John, and eight days after the birth, they have the circumcision, and they're going to have a ceremony, and that's when you name the child. And uh, all the family and everybody gathered there, they say, well, the child's name is Zechariah. No, Elizabeth says, his name's John. They're like, John? There's no John in the family name. Where's John come from? That can't be right. And they hand uh, a slate to uh, uh, Zechariah, and he writes, his name is John. And then his tongue is loosed, and he can speak and, and kind of fill him in on the whole story. Why, why all of that? Because it was his right to name him. But not so with Joseph. This one's name is already determined because it's not really his uh, right to do that. Joseph surrendered his right uh, to the infant God king, the a God man, he, he, uh, he has to acknowledge from the very beginning, I'm not going to be ultimately directing this one. He's going to direct me. Now, a any of you who are parents know how scary it is when you bring the first one home. You know, I can remember driving from the hospital. I never thought about the big deal of driving across the river from Kentucky to Ohio. And I was a nervous wreck. I think I drove the slowest on the way home, every bump, every, you know, and you're just conscious of everything. Can you imagine? You're charged with, you're going to take care of God's son? How? What do you do? How do you, how, how do you handle that? You and I are, are, are called to also acknowledge the supremacy of Christ in our lives. Uh, Jesus uh, said to uh, any who would follow after him, whoever uh, wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And we're, uh, we're called to, uh, to follow and obey him and trust him through the ups and downs of life. 
Kyle Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan, I think he, uh, he, he looks at our American culture and our churches and he, he's concerned about the gospel proclamation and how serious people really take whether they're followers of Jesus or not. He writes, my concern is that many of our churches in America have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus but have no interest in truly following him. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that requires anything from them. You see, when Jesus invites us to follow after him, yes, he provides heaven for us. Yes, he guarantees that we, ha we have his presence in our lives each day through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he, uh, he, he gives us peace and joy and the love of his presence. But when it comes to a time between our, our will and his will, we're to surrender to his will as he also surrendered his will to God the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane and willingly went to the cross. And that means through the ups and downs. There are people who walk away from faith because they, they, they go, God didn't answer my prayer. When we don't get what we want, does that change who God is? The reality is we, we need to trust him and cling to him through everything. There's a beautiful song by uh, Babby Mason uh, entitled, uh, Trust His Heart. And there are times when you and I go through rough patches in life, hard times. Uh, and we're, uh, we're called to just trust him through all of it. The words go, all things work for our good, though sometimes we don't see. How could they? Struggles that break our hearts in two sometimes blind us to the truth. Our Father knows what's best for us. His ways are not our own. So when our pathway grows dim and you don't see him, rem remember you're never alone. He sees, your <clears throat> he sees the master plan. He holds our future in his hand. So don't live as those who have no hope. All hope is found in him. We see the present clearly, but he sees the first and last. And like a tapestry, he's weaving you and me to someday be like him. God is too wise to make a mistake. He's too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. He alone is faithful and true. He alone knows what's best for you. Thirdly, you and I must have the courage to admit that we're sinners. Again, Gabriel said to Joseph, for he will save his people from their sin. Um, there's no place for self-righteousness or I can do this on my own or I, I, I am good enough uh, to earn God's favor uh, and be a follower of Jesus. We have to acknowledge our need uh, for him. There's really no forgiveness without repentance and there's no salvation without our surrender uh, to the Lord. Jesus, in his uh, great Sermon on the Mount, he begins it by, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In other words, blessed are we when we acknowledge that spiritually and uh, morally we're, we're beggars and we need God's mercy and his grace uh, to forgive us. And as he does that, uh, then we're, we're truly set free to uh, follow after him. And what hinders us from doing that is pride will get in the way. But when we let pride go and we humble ourselves, 
then we can uh, really uh, pursue him. It does take courage uh, to follow Christ, but here's the amazing thing to me, and I don't think I'm ever going to get over this. W the God of the Bible, the God that we worship, is not a God who says, do as I say, but it's do as I do. Because Jesus demonstrates and lives out perfectly what we're called to do. And in the end, it took far more courage uh, than we'll ever demonstrate in what Jesus did by leaving heaven and coming for us. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's exactly what he's done uh, for you and me. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you that you did not leave us in the storm of life, that you did not leave us in our own sin, but you sent your son, Jesus, to become one of us and to lead us to you. We thank you, uh, Jesus, for giving your life for us and to pro providing the way. And we pray that you would help us to uh, be courageous followers of yours, determined to uh, be faithful to the end, where one day we will be able to see you uh, face to face and hear your words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, bless each one, um, I pray, and help us to seek and follow after you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our uh, hymn of invitation is uh, Be Strong in the Lord. And as we stand and sing this uh, song, uh, maybe there is someone here this morning who uh, needs to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe someone needs to rededicate their life. Maybe God's been working on you, and uh, you know the next step is to join this church family. Uh, come as we stand and sing together.